the risk is you saw the Katrina. And that is, while the focus has been on floods from the river and protecting us from floods from the river, now we are vulnerable to floods from the coast. And in fact, we could argue that we've transformed or we've transitioned through manipulating the physics, the flood threats in the upper basin to those down to the coast from, I, I testified in, in front of a, a Senate uh, subcommittee meeting and, and there were people from North Carolina and other coastal states and they were all talking about people migrating out to tourist areas and very around and stuff like that. And I said, look, I said, this is not about people moving toward the coast in the Mississippi River. This is the coast moving toward people. <laughs> these, these, we made decisions of where to put New Orleans 300 years ago dedicated on 100 miles of cypress forest between, between New Orleans and the coast of Louisiana, 100 miles of cypress forest. Homa was settled knowing that there, that landscape was far beyond the, the seascape, far beyond where it is today. In fact, uh, uh, T. Baker Smith, Smith, engineer at Homa. He tell he talks about his his his, his dad his dad's home. They, for years at Homa they they prepared this house so it wouldn't, it wouldn't flood from what they call backwater. And he says, son of God and Isaac had gotten flooded from front water. That's what they call it. <laughs> so we, we completely transformed and we civilized. You folks in Sandy, hey, we're all in this thing together. And what we do in our coastal landscapes and how we deal with the geomorphology and how those land, landscapes are built, how they sustain, related to this, is some critical issues. And I can tell you, believe it or not, we have been through four hurricanes since Katrina. Four. And, for me, and what is amazing to me is watch us try to break the cycle. Because I'm telling you, after every disturbance and event, what happens? You rebuild right back to where you were. Breaking that cycle as a change in risk occurs is a real problem now. So coastal communities, what we have done, pretty simply, we have every five years required by the state to do what's called a state master plan. It's the state, it's the Louisiana Coastal Protection and Restoration Authority requires us to submit to the legislature, has to be approved by the legislature, and we just uh, uh, did a plan for 2012, and guess what were the two fundamental aspects of that plan. Reducing risk. How are we going to do risk? Build land. How are you going to build land? So it's fundamental. So basically the bottom line here is reduce these risks in the coastal community. We have to reconnect the river. One idea is to put diversions, physical concrete structures, so that we can actually what I call instead of doing flood control, we want to do control flood. And, and, and can we actually put up good landscapes? We can't put them everywhere. But the thing is, wherever we build this land is where we put people. And where we can't build land, we have to deal with the risk and options of how to protect people. And those are tough decisions. That's breaking the cycle. And it's taking advantage of unique events such as this 2008 flood year or 2011. This is not a day-to-day -day opening of gates and letting silt Right when the river flow is just flowing along, you know, at, at 50,000 cubic feet per second. This is capturing a flood of this magnitude, opening gates and getting 250,000 cubic feet per second that can carry and build sand in, like I showed you in the previous diagram. And we know we have landscapes, we have models to demonstrate how this can occur. There is still land building capacity in the river. Yes, we've lost half the sediment supply, but we still have capacity to build this. And we have structures such as this that have been in operation. We know the, the features of these structures. Uh, it's a matter of placing them. We know the outcomes. I showed you this slide earlier. So it really is about reducing risk. The analysis to give you an idea, in the last master plan, to these coastal communities along coastal Louisiana, and the reason these numbers are so high is because a lot of the infrastructure, oil and gas, ports, you know, this is not just fishing, fishing communities. These are services and, and infrastructure that supplies the nation uh, relatively to services. That we could reach 7.7 to $23 billion in annual damages within the next 50 years. And again, that's with the, now we can't get, reduce all that by just building land. It can't be sustained. So reduction of cultural risk. All about the 
It's all about water settlement. It's all about, in a restoration context, going back to the fundamentals and finding what people are, will allow us and as, a, as, a, as a community to do to reinvest floods, control floods, at places and points with the physics that will be sufficient to build land uh, that will reduce risk and try to find some concept of sustainability, which is not the delta we had 100 years ago. It is a new delta. It's a, and, and it's a, but, but finding ways to sustain it are fundamental. I gave this talk also and focused on deltas. This is the 2013 is our international year of deltas. Hopefully there will be resources for you to understand. I think deltas are a great example of teaching physics in the classroom. And if you want something that's real world, that really touches what, what is both from a history, civilization, you can get into all kinds of topics, but the fundamentals of moving, uh, of water moving settlement and building land have incredible importance, not only on the here in the U.S., but elsewhere. I want to, I want to thank my sponsors, uh, particularly the National Center for Earth Surface Dynamics, the University of Minnesota, that have been uh, very helpful, and I'll be glad to take any questions. Talk about how wetlands protect from floods and yes. ocean. It's basically just the distance and the reason. You bet. And, you know, you know, wetlands do not absorb the energy of a hurricane. And, and talking to a room of physicists, you know the energy. You know this. Uh, I had a uh, coastal oceanographer explain that to me. Um, physical oceanographer, and you know, really the presence of wetlands to a certain degree means an absence of water. And if you have wetlands there and you don't have the water surface, you don't have the fetch. And and, and you know and, and also remember that a lot of the surge that gets built out in the Gulf of Mexico, we have to live with that, right? But your barrier islands are really critical first lines of defense related to that that and knocking waves down and diminishing the surge. Then it's a matter of how much surge gets built after the storm passes that, which is, if you have a lot of open water, it's that fetch. And that, so that really uh, is what causes a lot of my problem. But to do anything affected, it takes extensive areas of land to be affected. And we've got a false sense of security that we build these small pockets of weapons we can reduce storm surge. No. Yeah, that's been a very interesting discussion because uh, there are, I, and I'll, this is a statistic that I've been told, I haven't checked it out myself. I mentioned 400 dams. There's actually four dams that, that actually trap 50% of what the sediment we've lost. And, and many of those dams are, uh, have uh, developed huge reservoirs. And many of those reservoirs are filling up. So there are issues upstream with sediment, you know, accumulating in places that are causing problems. And we would love to have those sediments downstream. In fact, at one time there was actually a discussion of uh, putting they were they were trying to get rid of sediment deposited in Indiana uh, in some of the reservoirs, putting them on barges and sending that sediment back to Louisiana. <laughs> Uh, what we have as a principle, and this is important to a group like this, and it's uh, one of our fundamental principles, our, our restoration program is to use nature as much as possible. And, and so the, there are ways of actually moving sediment through physics, but they're very artificial. And when you do that, it takes uh, energy, fossil fuels, and there are huge costs that you cannot sustain over you know, a 25, 50 year life cycle of the project. If you use nature and the flow of water you know, for free, that has a much more sustainable. So opening up some of these reservoirs and finding ways of releasing some of that sediment is, is a discussion. Can I have one quick point? There's an NRC report done on the Missouri River as far as sediment supply, though, I, I, I have to uh, bring up. Um, and, and it did say that 
there are limitations on what those options are. Um, yes. Can you comment on the consequences of the Mississippi Delta of uh, existing plans to divert uh, water from the uh, Mississippi towards Colorado? Uh, oh, I, I can't comment too much on that, uh, but there are, uh, you know, there are multiple issues like that, and that one I don't know the real specifics of. Uh, we, we have instances of those where these kinds of, uh, and that's basically for water supply, right? And, uh, you know, and, and these, are, these are very complicated issues, and of course, I'm against it. I mean, any diversion of water from the Mississippi River uh, is further threats to the Mississippi River Delta. Uh, you know, and what's really problematic in many of those uh, minimum flow standards uh, is that the laws that establish minimum flows actually occurred during one instance I know of when there was actually uh, abnormally high water. So you've got to look at what are the standards that people are requesting minimum flows for related to what's the natural process. But, but any, any uh, diversion of water from the Mississippi River would be problematic for us. But in addition to sediment flows and watersheds, um, there's also nutrient flows. You bet. You bet. That's, and I stay, you know, I didn't, and that's a very complicated trade off. It's a fascinating one because what this question was was not only is a sediment flow issue here, but there's a nutrient flow. Uh, agriculture uh, that has expanded, which is most of the weight, I, I said New Orleans port, the largest, like tonnage, a large part of that's grain and other, other uh, agricultural products, chickens and milk, and uh, I guess. Um, but the point is, is uh, that requires fertilizer in the upper watershed. A lot of uh, fertilizer is converted to nitrate. Nitrate flows down the river uh, and fuels hypoxia off the coast of Louisiana by producing excess of algae. When they decompose at the bottom of the water, they consume oxygen, causes hypoxia. So here we have in the last 40 years a reduction of sediment and a quadrupling of nitrate. Now, in order to get water into a wetland to build, to introduce sediment, we are now introducing nitrate and causing water quality problems. So there is actually, you know, a discussion of whether or not water quality issues will prevent us from putting the river back in our landscapes because of water quality issues. Yeah. Boy, look, I, I tell you, this is going to this is going to be huge. I mean, we're on the front lines of it. Uh, anybody, you know, on the Mid Atlantic coast since Sandy, uh, you know, the editorials of, of getting rid of the National Flood Insurance Program. Uh, you know, insurance. I will say this: in all the discussions that we've had since Katrina, when we talk about changing human behavior, the number one thing that would change human behavior is insurability. Talent is the number one factor. And, and as soon as subsidies and the true cost of risk are, 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 are you know, covered by the individual living in their homes or business, is trying to go small business, and they don't get subsidies on the true risk, it changes the whole landscape. We're seeing something that on the Mississippi Gulf Coast when the cost of insurance is so high that People are not you, you bet. It is, and, 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 and municipalities can't afford to put utilities back. And, 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 and states don't subsidize their insurance. And, and I'll give you one quick statistic. I know we're running over. Most of the oil and gas infrastructure in coastal Louisiana is self insured. A lot of the other infrastructure is reinsurance coverage, and then what you have is uh, private, all states of the world. So it's, when you say insurance, you have to make sure you, you understand there are three different types of insurance that change the behavior. It's a really good question. Get ready.